Good morning. I'm going to stay muted unless you ask me to talk. Great. Thank you. Welcome. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for gathering. Uh, my name is Peter Buckley. I'm uh, a member of the Early Learning Council along with Peg Miller, my cohort here for the Home Visiting Systems Committee. I want to welcome everybody here. Glad you could gather uh, for this uh, um, really important work that we're engaged in. Um, we're going to have to do introductions in, in just a, a minute and a half, go around and ask people to introduce themselves. Um, I will start just briefly. I, I, I'm a former legislator. Um, I uh, served in the legislature for 12 years and uh, left legislature in 2017. I now work for a group called Southern Oregon Success, which is a collaboration of all levels of education and healthcare and human services and public safety and workforce development in Jackson, Josephine counties. Our goal as a collaboration is to make sure every child reaches kindergarten ready to thrive. So uh, with that, Peg, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Peg Miller. I'm a, a pediatrician and uh, I work in Yamhill County, have been in the county for over 20 years and uh, always have worked in smaller communities. Did primary care um, until about five years ago and I am currently the pediatric hospitalist at our local hospital. Um, I have a passion for home visiting because I've seen the successes it can bring to families uh, that need a little extra boost. And uh, I'm also on the Early Learning Council um, and happy to work with everybody. We appreciate everybody attending. Thanks. Thanks, Peg. So if we can, let's do a, just a quick uh, it, just a introduction, just who you are, uh, maybe who you work with and uh, what your um, connection is to home visiting. Uh, let's start with Kelly. Yep, I'm sorry, I should give Christy a chance because Christy's our cohort here. Christy, go ahead and get yeah. off. There you go. Christy is our, our consultant and facilitate, helping to facilitate all this. So go ahead, Christy. Yeah, you bet. And thanks, Kelly. We just got up a little introduction slide for us there. There's a couple of different questions. My name is Christy Cox. My preferred pronouns are she and her. I'm working as a consultant to help support the Early Learning Council's new Home Visiting System Committee. So you all, but also the subcommittee called the Working Team um, I used to work with the Ford Family Foundation and helped to support the development and launch of their home visiting system coordination project back in 2015. And so that's something that I'm happy to bring to the table. I'm currently, I used to live in Roseburg, Oregon, um, a proud member of the Cow Creek tribe, uh, and now working and living in Kennewick, Washington. Uh, so a little bit far, farther from those homelands, but one thing I would share that's really exciting for me about this home visiting systems work is to help to elevate and just really celebrate and honor home visitors and the incredible work that they do one on one with families and children. Uh, and the important part that they play in plugging into the bigger early childhood system. So, uh, and I, my favorite ice cream, uh, pr pr uh, peanut butter and chocolate in the winter time and daiquiri ice in the summer. <laughs> Very nice. Thanks, Christy. 
Now, yeah. Kelly, how, how about you, Kelly? Yes, thank you for that, Peter. I was hitting the space bar to try to unmute myself temporarily and accidentally showed you basically all of our introduction slides. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Kelly Taylor. My pronouns are they, them, there. I am an administrative specialist with the Early Learning Division, and I'm going to be your administrative support for both the committee and the subcommittee for this home visiting system team. Um, I live in Eugene, Oregon, been an Oregon resident, born and bred here. Um, and I'm really, really excited to go ahead and see this coming to like a full formal level of collaboration and trying to work our systems together with this extremely important key concept. Um, and my favorite ice cream would have to be just the plain cheapest chocolate that I can get. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Benjamin. Good morning, everyone. I'm Benjamin Hazelton, and I am the um, Home Visiting Policy and Systems Coordinator at the Maternal and Child Health Section of the or Oregon Health Authority. And um, I also manage the Maternal Infant and Early Childhood Home Visiting Grant. I am a he, him, and I live in Portland. I feel like I have the best job in the state because I get to um, promote home visiting and its value to everyone um, uh, across models and systems, et cetera. So um, I'm super excited about this opportunity. And I think my favorite ice cream is a Tillamook custard that's got like honeycomb or caramelized. Anyway, uh, it's something like it's like it's like a yeah, caramelish. <laughs> it sounds good. Thanks, Benjamin. Brenda. Hi, I'm Brenda Kamini. I'm the director for the Early Learning Hub of Central Oregon. So that covers Crook, Deschutes, Jefferson Counties, and the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs partners with us. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and um, I represent, I think, on this um, group, the Early Learning Hub directors but how I come to the home visiting world is I previously uh, was with the Commission on Children and Families. And in that capacity, we started up um, Healthy Families Home Visiting, as well as working with our public health partners on um, nurse home visiting. And so that kind of brings me to what excites me about this work is I think it's the right time and a wonderful opportunity to figure out the interconnectedness of our stakeholders in the home visiting world and promote the workforce in a way that front facing the families were responsive to them and um, look and act um, as a cohesive system um, in working with them. Oh, the where I reside, I actually reside physically in Crick County, but I grew up further east. So I have a little bit of a, um, rural flavor, I think, um, to this work. And my favorite ice cream or frozen treat this time of year is definitely Hawaiian ice. Nice, thanks, Brenda. Kate Wilcox. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kate Wilcox. I use the she, her pronouns. Um, I am the maternal and child health manager in uh, the Oregon Health Authority. And it's in our section that, um, the work Benjamin described resides as well as the nurse home visiting program. So nurse home partnership, babies first. Um, we collaborate with OHSU on the cocoon program and the newest kid on the block, the Family Connects Oregon program. So um, we have a lot going on. Um, I reside typically in Portland, but today I'm looking out over the ocean at Lincoln City. And it's kind of lovely to do a little work when I'm not really working, so. <laughs> um, and the thing that excites me about this systems work is um, since I arrived in 2009, um, we've, we've been struggling to try to create a home visiting system where all the partners come together and work. And we've had spits and fits, what we've tried, and then we haven't had the pathway around which to really elevate 
and be able to solidify that work. And so then, and then um, people change, uh, new people come, some people leave. So what really excites me is that I think finally we have a really exciting pathway uh, to elevate um, the collaboration and the ideas that the, the various models have in terms of creating a system that really is seamless to families. I mean, families don't really care whether it's healthy families or babies first or any other model, they just want the support. And so how can we create a system that is really seamless for them? Um, and my frozen ice cream treat, I think would be anything um, chocolate with chocolate in it, but sorry, Christy, not peanut butter. It can only be chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kate. Harriet. Thank you, Peter. I'm Harriet Dichter and I use she, her pronouns and I um, assist Oregon as a consultant through the BUILD initiative and so have been engaged in um, this stimulating pre-planning work uh, to be able to get to this committee, which is great. Um, I live on the East Coast in Philadelphia, and um, I am excited about this work now because I feel like um, we're trying to set this up to get to something concrete and actionable. And so um, not that there aren't many lofty areas we have to be working on in the home visiting system to get to a coherent system, but I'm excited about the idea of being able to advance just maybe some targeted, really actionable items that will be supportive around the different visions and the work um, that Kate, because I can see Kate on the screen, and others who've been working on this for a long time have had um, to advance the system. Um, my favorite ice cream or other frozen treats. I'd like other desserts better. However, I like things with caramel in them. So ice cream with caramel. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Julie. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Julie Seastrom, and I'm Vice Chair of Tribal Council for the Coos, uh, Lower Umpqua and Seriously Indians here in Coos Bay, Oregon. And I'm also on uh, the Early Learning Division um, as uh, one of the members who's been working on that. And they um, encourage me uh, to uh, volunteer and work on this um, incredible uh, project that you all have been working on for a long time. So I'm very much a newcomer uh, to what you've been doing. And I did start reading the documents that you sent. However, I did not get all the way through them. So I'm going to be very quiet and I'm going to be listening and learning this this today. You know, So uh, any way I can be helpful, I would like to be helpful. And anything I can take back to our tribes, I will take back to our tribes and then come back to you with whatever kind of response that we have within our tribe. And um, anything that we can do for our children uh, to uh, help them learn and grow, uh, I'm for all for that. And chocolate is my favorite ice cream. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Mary. Hi, I'm Mary Dean. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Family First and Integrated Policy Manager at the Oregon Department of Human Services. This is week three for me in this position. Um, so bear with me if I don't have answers to questions yet. Um, but I'm, uh, I reside in Milwaukee, Oregon. And one thing that really excites me about this work, um, like Brenda, it sounds like I used to work with the Commission on Children and Families in Multnomah County. Um, Pre-hub development, I helped run our early childhood council and did regular training opportunities for home visitors to our uh, early childhood learning community um, and really fell in love with home visiting and with where child welfare is at now, looking at a, transforming our system and really trying to keep families together. I think the work of home visitors is gonna be critical in supporting families and wanna be part of creating, I think what Kate mentioned of a seamless system um, of support for families. So I'm, I'm excited to be here. Oh, and my favorite ice cream, I've only gotten to have I think two, maybe three times, which is specifically coconut ice cream on San Pedro in Belize. 
<laughs> Not only the ice cream, it's but worth the trip. It is the best. <laughs> Not good. Delightful. Thanks, Mary. Melissa. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Melissa Zaborin. She, her, hers. And I am an assistant vice president of Medicaid operations for IHN CCO, Center Community Health Network, in the Lynn, Benton, and Lincoln region, county region. Uh, I am also a co-chair of our early learning hub across our region, the governing board that we have. And as a CCO, we are a funder of many different activities that kind of relate to the home visiting program. We also have internal programs and we work with public health that has uh, similar programs. So I am actually very excited about this work because there's there's a lot of coordination that needs to happen um, to ensure that uh, home visiting is seamless for our members. And, and it is all about what the members need at the end of the day and how we deliver that to them to, as, to not make it so complicated um, and getting them what they need when they need it. Uh, I am actually, I live in West Salem, so I actually live in Marion County. Well, it's Polk County, actually, where I'm at. Um, and my favorite ice cream is Rocky Road all the way, all year round. <laughs> Thanks, Melissa. Rick. Hello, um, my name is Rick Ruzica. Um, I use he, him pronouns. Um, I am the Interim Assistant Director of Planning and Policy in the Affordable Rental Housing Division at Oregon Housing and Community Services. Um, the Affordable Rental Housing Division is essentially the housing finance agency for the state, so we provide financing to build low-income um, housing across uh, Oregon. Uh, I reside in uh, Salem. Uh, I've been in Salem for five years previous to that. Um, I was, uh, I'm a Midwest transplant and I ran housing authorities uh, for 25 years uh, prior to coming to Oregon. Um, I'm excited about um, really learning how um, housing, which obviously is a huge social determinant of health, uh, uh, fits in uh, to the home visiting uh, system. Um, I'm new to this discipline. I think I was invited because um, we are, we're, we're dipping our toe more in, um, in, in, in this discipline and uh, with our co-location effort, which is to really try to bring early learning centers into uh, the development of affordable rental housing. And so that's, the, that's an initiative that I'm responsible for. And I think why I got brought um, into this committee. And I'm just excited to learn more about Kind of what you do and how you do it and see how I can help. Um, and uh, my favorite ice cream uh, is definitely cookies and cream. Happy to be here. Thank you. Robin Hill Dunbar, who are you? Good morning. I'm Robin Hill Dunbar and I am from the Ford Family Foundation. It's I just love getting to know all of these new faces. So I'm excited to do this work with all of you. I am um, a senior program officer in the Children, Youth, and Families Department. As Christy mentioned, we work together on this work, and I'm excited. Um, I live in Roseburg. It's a headquarters for the Ford Family Foundation. We serve rural communities all over Oregon and uh, Northern California, Siskiyou County, California. And I am excited about way too many things to list one thing, but listening to everyone it certainly um, inspires me on so many levels. But I was thinking about it while I was listening. And 20 years ago, starting in my career, I was a home visitor for teen parents in the metro area. And um, as a mom myself, parenting is like the hardest thing and the most important thing we'll ever do. And so there's no instructions. We all need support no matter who we are, but some um, the complications of the system and how it's difficult to understand and for all the reasons, coordination and what we've learned in communities in the last six years plus um, really excites me to share that and think about it with all of you um, in this work. So I'm excited about a lot of things. 
Um, ice cream, I all I could think of was homemade ice cream is best of yeah. all. And vanilla is just great, but all the flavors that everyone listed all sounded great to me. So <laughs> I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. And you're very open, Robin. You're, you're open to anything. That's great. <laughs> Thanks. Serena. Um, good morning, Serena Stoudemire Wesley, and I am the Systems Early Learning Deputy Director and Chief of Programs, um, State of Oregon, and I live in Portland, Multnomah County. Um, and what excites me about the home visiting system is that I um, I remember at the early 2000, we were trying to get everyone together at Portland State, so finally seeing that it's coming too after all these years. Um, that everyone across the state is coming together to do some collaborating and finally moving it forward and hopefully creating some systemic systems so that they'll be there for when we're gone uh, and there'll be a legacy excites me. And I'm not really an ice cream person, but when I do decide to cheat, I like the Haagen-Dazs caramel. <laughs> Thanks, Serena. It is delicious. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome, Peter. Hey, Sue Miller. Who are you? Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Sue Miller. I chair the Early Learning Council, which is a huge privilege for me. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I reside in Portland. And I am very excited about this because um, many years ago, when I was the executive director of the Relief Nursery in Salem, I had the privilege of going on many home visits with the HFO visitors, as well as we had an early Head Start program. So I know the difference that home visitors make in families' lives, and I'm just excited to have a small part in trying to make those visits more accessible and um, acceptable as well to families. Um, and I love coffee ice cream of almost any kind. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Tanil. Hello, everyone. My name is Tanil Weatherall. She, her pronouns. I'm the assistant superintendent of the Office of Enhancing Student Opportunities at the Oregon Department of Ed, which is a really beautiful name for <laughs> um, birth uh, to 12 grade special education. So that whole system. Um, uh, a lot of our ed, uh, special programs, YSEP, JDEP, uh, long-term care and treatment, hospitals, pediatric, um, nursing, and then the Oregon School for the Deaf and a couple other fun uh, little items that I get to work on um, at the department. I reside in Eugene, but I just moved here uh, two months ago after being on the South Coast in North Bend, Oregon, um, with uh, next to Julie uh, for 17 years. So this is a new space for me to be in. Excited about that. And my whole family is transitioning from the South Coast to this environment. Um, so big moves for us. Um, I am excited about, um, like someone else named, really all of the things that people are have been sharing and really thinking about how the birth to three early intervention support home visiting system can be uh, enhanced and um, supported by the other systems that district or that uh, families are getting. Uh, so what can we do differently, better? Um, and also how can we partner in ways that create more meaningful uh, supports for families, especially those who, who might be struggling with um, children who have more severe needs. So that, that feels really important to me. And I don't eat ice cream that much either, but when I do, I prefer ice cream that has other things in it. So like the, like the base doesn't matter so much, but like put some chocolate, put some cookie, add a chunk of something, and I'm more happy than with just plain ice cream. So it was really hard to choose, especially after you all shared your ice cream. So I think I should have gone first on the ice cream choice, but I'm super happy to be here and looking forward to getting to know you all better. Thanks, Neil. Did I miss anybody? And I think I reached everybody. Very good. Well, thank you all for gathering once again. This is important work and it's, it could be just really game changing work here. So with that, I'll pass it back over to, to Peg and Christy. Well, 
Well, again, thanks uh, everybody for coming. Um, and, and we appreciate you taking time out of your, um, your busy schedule. We, uh, uh, Peter and Christy and I got together uh, a week or so ago and, and kind of chatted a little bit and wanted to sort of set the tone about, um, about this committee and, and kind of uh, the tone we wanted to use in meetings and so forth. And, one of the things that came up is that home visiting is very relationship based. And um, we were hoping that people could sort of share what behaviors they think um, create trusting relationships. Uh, maybe first of all, talking about with kids and their primary caregivers. Um, those of you that are parents, um, you know, what helps you establish trust with your kids. All of us observe families uh, in, in the work that we do. And, and what uh, have you seen that helps establish those, those trusting relationships with kids? I can start. Um, I think, you know, first and foremost, bring, being present and then creative play. So I think giving, you know, children that space to um, explore and play is all a learning experience that creates a bond too with the caregiver, you know, providing that, but first and foremost, being present and active in, in their lives. Yeah, I would certainly agree with that. Um, other people, we've got some interesting stuff in the chat. Um, people talking about consistency, uh, listening to kids, listening to learn kind of where they're coming from, um, using humor. Uh, it has to be fun, right? Parenting is too much, uh, too hard to work or being a caregiver is too hard to work to not have it be fun. Other people? Giving kids space. Yeah, great, Serena, thank you. Uh, trying to get some games, I would agree, yeah. And, and showing that you're really caring about their well-being, I would agree with that, right? Christy, songs and music and uh, humming, rocking. Boy, you know, music is a real theme and, and we know that that's so important for kids uh, in learning language and, um, and so forth. And, and even uh, uh, a key to numerology for, for kids uh, or numeracy for kids um, learning their numbers and the rhythms and patterns and so forth. Yeah, outdoor experiences, boy, Julie, that is that really is true. Um, I, I'm reading this great book, The Last Child in the Woods, that really talks about how important um, outdoor experiences are for kids, for their emotional well-being, their creativity, all of those things. Yeah, boy, reading um, isn't that important. You know, we've, um, and, and encouraging parents to read to their kids and, and how important that is we can uh, promote reading and literacy. Yeah, that the regulation, boy, is that ever important, particularly now with where we're seeing kids that haven't been around other children very much and, and learning that new social emotional control. Other things, Christy, do you have more to add? Well, I, I like Benjamin's uh, regulation, serve and return. Uh, I, I read a, a, a book recently that's talking about how because of screens, we're, we're giving our children less serve and return mm -hmm. than uh, previous generations and that that's having an impact. 
Yeah, I, I think that really is true. Um, and, and Julie, your comment about creative tech experiences, it, I think it's a given that kids are going to have tech experiences, but if we can make those as positive and and when kids are really young, if we can limit those and be selective about what they're exposed to. Yeah, that's great, Peg. Thanks for helping us get some of that language out there and thinking about kind of what it is like for young children to be with caring care caregivers and really us trying to create this parallel process, right, for this committee, right, and having trusting and nurturing and creative and uh, relationships with one another, and that takes time. I think that's another thing I would add there, it just takes time and being consistent and present. Um, and also, you know, thinking about our role as a committee and having those relationships with communities, uh, home visitors with their primary caregivers, they're serving in primary caregivers with their young children. So really we have this parallel process from the state level formal public meeting group, right, all the way through the home visitors sitting with parents and, and their young children. And so I wondered if we could take another minute here and think about this at, at this committee level, um, share, can we translate what we just shared, some of the language and words that we just shared um, on that first prompt and think about jointly creating just some initial language or some preliminary language that could help us articulate some group norms, or I like saying ways we wanna to be together. How do we wanna to be together as a committee um, from now until the foreseeable future, but, we can change these. So just trying to capture a few ideas um, from you all about how you translate those caregiver children relationships and then into how we want to be together as a committee. So feel free to share verbally. Um, of course, everyone's used the chat as well. So either one of those ways and we'll capture these and kind of draft up some group norms from your responses. We could have Harriet read us a story at the start of every meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, oh, sorry. underlying things is to treat people with respect um, and, and, uh, and the listening thing kind of translates nicely as well. Yeah, that's what I was going to share. I wrote listening to learn and, uh, and what I mean by that is using all of our senses to help try to figure out what's happening for the child with the child. And I think that it feels the same for us. You know, we're not in person, but we have to think about all the things that make up how someone's presenting and um, listening to really think through what people mean. And, and um, so we can comment respectfully and the like. I think uh, saying that we all come from different perspectives on this. We have uh, common goals, but different perspectives and, and uh, being respectful of that. Yeah, I like being curious. That's great. Thanks, Mary. Being playful, listening to learn, listening to one of one at a, one person at a time. Anything else that anybody would like to share, just in terms of the ways that we at least at this time, know that we might want to be together, like how we want our committee to function, and behave with one another. Well, one thing I'm committed to is some music. So a little bit of a bust, I think, on the It's a Beautiful Morning. I hope everybody had it playing in their mind. And if you didn't, <laughs> go look up the Rascals on YouTube and listen to that song it just it made me feel so good thinking about being here with you all so I think trying to help us be able to to be har harmonized together and I don't mean that in necessarily the musical way but just as human beings like getting settled together having shared experiences together and 
uh, being able to um, have this ha have this time together. It's really precious all the time that will be spent here. So um, I just appreciate you all and appreciate the things that you've shared there. And please feel free to email any other suggestions around ways that we want to be together if you didn't have a chance to think about it or respond here or need more time. Well, great. I, I think we're going to move on. We're going to move on. Uh, and there, there's that nice little graphic here. Um, we just want to, to acknowledge that uh, um, you know, this this committee is um, is building on the work that's that's been going on from a number of people, uh, particularly the collaborative uh, that uh, Benjamin has been uh, leading to really focus uh, how we work how we work together. Uh, and to, to actually create a home visiting system that works for all of Oregon's families. So this little graphic is, is, is hopefully just giving a, a kind of uh, display of how we look at all this coming together. The, this, this committee itself is not trying to supplant the work of anybody else. We're just trying to basically be the vehicle to bring it to the Early Learning Council and have the Early Learning Council be the vehicle to uh, uh, expand the work throughout the state and, and deal with the um, uh, the legislature deal with everything else that has to uh, any deal with the early learning hubs, etc., in all of our communities. So we have the collaborative, uh, and which is basically kind of merging with the subcommittee working team now. Uh, and then we ha actually have the uh, home visiting partners uh, and the families that we work with, all, all all basically driving the work. This committee's job, like I mentioned, is to to kind of coalesce the work, bring it forward, understand the work of the collaborative, the subcommittee working team and the people on the front line and be able to elevate it up to the Early Learning Council. So just wanted to acknowledge that uh, this is not to supplant the work that's being done, it's basically to enhance and uh, elevate the work that's being done and with a lot of gratitude for the work that's been done and is being done uh, by the collaborative and the subcommittee uh, working team which is really the, the folks that are, that are gonna move this forward. Uh, Peg and I and Sue hopefully will be able to uh, be advocates for this work on the Early Learning Council and beyond that as well. So are any questions on that from anybody? Does that, does that all make sense? And Christy, if I left something off that you thought that should be mentioned, please let me know. No, just to let people know in the chat there that the the overview is on page 31. And I think all of you probably have seen the at least the first two pages of the overview when Sue did the invitation. I think she included it. Those first two pages are largely the same as what you would have seen before. And the third page actually of that overview is some new information. It really tries to um, articulate the relationships between these different groups, the overlaps of membership between the groups, but then also our commitment to the, the as Peter said, the families, the home visitors and the, the community partners, um, and that there'll be dedication to elevating parent and community voice through the process at the working team level throughout that time. So just to be clear, the collaborative is the, the committee, the working team all together, or is that a separate thing? Yeah, I'm happy to answer that, but Benjamin, please jump in if that um, if I miss something or don't articulate it well. So the collaborative is an existing informal group that's been gathered. Benjamin has been the convener there and set the table um, for several years for home visiting model leads around the state and also agency leads that work in the home visiting arena at that state level um, to come together and really focus on building relationships, getting to know each other in order to do better work together to improving systems and, and the network of home visiting services. So that group's an existing group, kind of I call it informal, uh, and the working team uh, is, is a formal subcommittee of this committee. And so the interplay there between the collaborative and the working team is really like helping each other stay informed, leaning on the collaborative for more information, more data, reporting, things that they know that the working team might not know, but also the working team sharing information back to the collaborative so that there's a nice feedback loop, particularly over these next six months. Uh, and then I, I think we're just imagining that the collaborative is this essential group in the state uh, will continue on and help support this committee and the Early Learning Council in the future as you know experts and when it comes to implementation. Thank you. Is that helpful? Okay, great. Other questions? Uh, 
It looks like then, um, Peter, for the next slide, I think that the group does need to take a look at or think about the charter for this particular committee. Mm -hmm. it, it looks very similar to the first page of the overview, so there's not a ton of additional information, but we can flash that up on the screen, so that's helpful, but it's also on page 34 of your PDF packet. Um, I think we just want to have make make sure we take a minute to review that charter language, see if there's comments or questions, and then correct me if I'm wrong. I think that this group may need to like approve or adopt it, and then that approval or adoption I think runs up then to the early learning council, uh, in terms of like the the next time the ELC meets that they would um, hear about your approval and adoption of this of this charter. I think Kelly is able to. Um, show that on screen, but again, it's on page 34. It's a two-page document. I'm sorry, I'm having issues pulling that up for some reason. Oh, okay. So I, I don't know if folks had a chance to read this over. I mean, it's if people are comfortable with it, we can adopt it now. If uh, people want more time with it, uh, it's perfectly fine. We can adopt it in, at our next meeting in October, but it's pretty straightforward. It's basically just setting out uh, kind of the parameters of this committee. I have a I have a comment, and I have a few comments about the uh, working team, okay. uh, the work group. So for our committee charter, you use two words in there. Um, that are different, but in different spaces. So in the beginning, we talk about a coordinated and equitable system. And then later on, we talk about an integrated system. And I think coordinated and integrated is, is a little bit of two different things. And so if we could just maybe replicate the language in both spots. Just a minor thing that um, just thinking about it in, in terms of those are two separate things. Um, for the working team in their scope of work, and I think that is on, I'm trying to figure out the page, on page two of that charter, which is 32 in the packet. Um, what I think would be helpful is we have identified and agree upon components of comprehensive home visiting networks and describing the services, the network that currently exists. But I think an analysis of uh, possible challenges um, and community communications as strategies, um, just trying to think of what unintended consequences any shift in what we recommend could have. So I guess thinking about um, how there are other programs that exist uh, that have like similar screening requirements for one thing. If we implement something or we do an, an assessment of the network, we have to consider the wraparounds that also exist. And so just kind of incorporating that into the working team scope would maybe be helpful. Great points, Melissa. Christy, I'm assuming you're taking notes. I am taking notes. I, is there, would you, do you have any specific language? I captured kind of your general sentiments, but any specific thing or a, a, a way that you would want it captured there? Uh, maybe as a second bullet in between the first and the second, um, I had kind of written a few little notes, like assess possible challenges uh, and other programmatic linkage, linkages um, and consider community communication, that's not helpful, but <laughs> um, the it community is. communication components is how do we communicate the impact of home visiting and whatever we need to do to create warm handoffs um, and coordinate the different buckets of work related 
Um, so that might actually be somewhat of a separate bullet point um, as we think about, I think it's number, what is this, number five. So prioritizing strategies and recommendation for advancement um, to the committee. It says include staffing, funding, and other resource needs. And it could be including um, communication strategies. Nice. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thanks. Any other thoughts on the draft documents? Is there any, is there a preference from this group of uh, adopting the charter now, or would you like to wait until October to adopt the charter? One thought that I have is uh, maybe we could provisionally adopt it, knowing that um, we'll finalize it with these uh, pieces of input, which are wonderful. Because um, I, I don't know if you want to take something back to the council itself just to let them know what's going on with this and maybe a provisional um, adoption um, might be a good thing, an in-between step. I appreciate that, Kate. And it, it, as always, you know, it, these aren't written in stone, so uh, can always be uh, changed, adjusted as we go forward. Yes, I was, this is Serena, I was wondering that because I'm just now going through the document. So um, it would be nice to have a, another day or two. You bet, you bet. Uh, this is Sue and if I could just make one comment and it may just be semantics, but because this committee is a committee of the Early Learning Council, it's the council that will actually be adopting the charter for the committee. We adopt charters, you know, a charter for every committee we form. So we would certainly want your recommendation and uh, Melissa, your input's been great. So it, it may well be provisional or preliminary, but we'll certainly be taking something to the council just to keep them current and, and updated on what's going on with your committee. So I just wanted to throw that in, but Serena, there's certainly opportunity for more input and suggestions would be great. Thank you, Sue. Thanks, Sue. So I, I'm getting the sense that we could uh, bring this to the Early Learning Council uh, saying that there's general support for the charter, uh, but the, 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 this committee would like to continue to look at it and uh, give a formal recommendation in October. Peter, I would just like to point out that Mary has her hand up. Oh, great. Thank you, Mary. This may go back to the kind of structural picture. I saw parents in one of the circles, um, but I'm a big fan and thinking about system transformation alignment of having the voices of people impacted even in the design and system conversations. And I'm not clear how parents will be part of the conversation. Um, and I'm wondering in terms of just the membership um, aspect. That's a great. That's a great question. A great point. Would it Would it be helpful to talk about that now, or there's a slide that's coming up in a little bit that talks about the working team's work? But then maybe that's a good spot to um, unpack that some more, Mary. That'd be great. That's fine. Okay. There's also a question in the chat about uh, if people have other comments, can they send them via email? Um, where would that be best sent? To Christy. Maybe okay. Christy. Christy could probably, we all have Christy's email address, but uh, Christy, maybe you could put it in the chat again anyway. 
Yes, it is a very unprofessional um, email that is, you know, I would call it my spy girl email. So now you all have it. <laughs> I would say from when Hotmail was built. <laughs> so whenever that happens. So yeah, feel free. Media underscore noche seven at hotmail.com. And for those of you who are Spanish speakers, that's midnight seven. Nice. But yes, um, any and all thoughts, comments, questions, like concerns or and particularly if you're wanting wording changed or you have a concern or red flag with wording I think we want to make sure that we capture that so in an email but you can also here how about this well you're also uh you're welcome to call me as well either way whatever's your preferred way to talk about it oh okay because I do have one Christy sorry I should have raised my hand <laughs> no, <that's great. laughs> um and it's just a play um, on the word, using the word culturally responsive instead of culturally appropriate. I think we would probably, because culturally appropriate includes responsive, being responsible, being responsive to cultural beliefs, religion, um, race, gender, and culturally, just saying culturally responsive is just, just being, is limiting it. Whereas culturally appropriate, it encompasses it all. Hmm. Got it. Thank you, Serena. Um, Peter, could I just ask that you you put some kind of time frame on getting input back to Christy? Ideally, the council would be able to adopt this at our September 28th meeting um, rather than rolling it over to the retreat because the retreat is going to be solely focused on our strategic plan. So Absolutely. if if you and, and committee members are comfortable with that, if you could just do a week or two maybe to get input to Christy and then we'd have time to get a revised version out to all of you before it would land on the council agenda. That makes sense Sue. I'd encourage people to uh, strike where the iron is hot to, to why this is in your mind try to get the info to Christy this week if you can while it's still in your mind. But uh, I'm sure Christy will still accept things next week too. But let's let's keep it till uh, uh, by the end of the end of August at the latest, please. Yeah, if it's in September, it better come with ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> well, very good. Well, thank you, everyone, for the um, for the focus on the the draft documents. And again, any comments and uh, uh, proposed changes, please get to Christy. So now we have a slide to reflect and discuss. Write down your reflection on the info shared so far, what comments or questions are coming up for you. We've been kind of doing that, but because uh, this, I don't think that this group doesn't seem shy in, in sharing um, their, uh, their thoughts on various things. Very good. Should we just jump ahead to the uh, to this video? Yeah, here? yeah, we sure can. I think um, one thing, if I can just say just for a moment, like one of the real main purposes, and I think it's on the agenda as well, the top, but it's just really to for us to 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 get on a similar page or at least get in the same book. Let's call it that, like where we we have some shared knowledge and language about home visiting, and we have some shared um ways of you know thinking about it and having in our minds and one way is this, this video that benjamin found is fantastic um and then this whole next short section is really to help kind of ground us all in really the programmatic part of home visiting so i think that will be more of the focus for this time that benjamin has uh and then we'll talk again back up at the systems level after he's uh finished so I'll just hand it over to Benjamin. I thank you very much for taking on the section. And um, should we just have Kelly go play with the video and then have you start, Benjamin? Sounds good.
visiting program because I appreciated the one-on-one -on -one attention and it was a little bit less intimidating than maybe going it alone. The most important part, we'll talk about my son Andrew, um, his development, what at his age, what is happening, what's the norm, I guess, kind of, if I have any concerns about anything that's going on with him, and she will answer those questions. Before starting the home visiting program, I was nervous because of having someone from the outside come into my house. I'm not the best housekeeper, and when I started, there was never a concern about if it was less than neat, if it was hot, cold, whatever. My visitors were very comfortable and I like that. I have always believed that education and taking care of our children start at home and they put so much emphasis on education in schools, but it really starts before they ever go to school. One thing that the home visiting program has helped me to learn about myself is how good of a mom I am. There's just a confidence of having someone come in and tell you that your child is perfect and you're doing everything right when everything else is telling you that maybe you're not. Being in the home visiting program has made me a more confident person in general, which has given me the courage to try to start my own business and to go back to school and to just step out in ways that I wouldn't have prior. Hi, uh, it's Benjamin again, and I neglected to say that the reason I'm here, I'm not a member, voting member of this committee, but I'm a, a co-chair with two other lovely human beings of the working team. That includes uh, Gwen Bechtel from the Early Learning Division and Ruby Ramirez from the Oregon Community Foundation, who were unable to be with us today. So um, first and foremost, free, uh, voluntary and free to the family are hallmarks of early childhood home visiting. And when we're talking about early childhood home visiting, um, for our purposes and for our focus in this committee and in the working team, we are focusing on you know, pregnancy to the, baby, the child's age five. Um, there are home visiting programs available after that, but that's sort of our, our scope as we talk together. Um, and while it's voluntary and free, uh, one of the challenges is that the majority of these programs are eligibility based, so there, there needs to be some family stressor identified or some circumstance in the family that makes them eligible for the service. Um, and those could be things like low educational attainment, uh, low income, previous experiences with child protective services, etc. Uh, and um, so that leads to um, home visiting models and programs looking different um, depending on what families they're outreaching to. So you could end up with programs that can only be delivered by a nurse, programs that aren't delivered by nurses, et cetera. So it's a really broad category of training and education that comes to the workforce of home visiting. And what I do want to say uh, and the change differences in the length of enrollment and frequency of visits, the duration that they're enrolled, et cetera. There are other things that are shared um, across home visiting or from my viewpoint, and that is that I believe they're all working, um, as the video sort of demonstrated, to uh, encourage, they're working with the parent or caregiver and the child 
to build healthy relationships, social emotional health, and get the, the, those children off to a great start um, and improve uh, well being outcomes for parents, children, families, and communities. Next slide, please. So <laughs> this, I'm just providing this as an example. This is something that I developed for our site visit from the Health Resources and Services Administration in June of 2021 to show some of the relationships. And I know many of you here at the meeting today, this, this visual helps, I think, understand why our brains feel sometimes scattered and why we, why we might not feel as coordinated as we would like. Um, so really what I'm just trying to demonstrate here is that uh, those, the community-based organizations, the ovals at the bottom are, you know, programs providing home visiting. And you can see the number of lines that could be connected to any one of those. And this is just the McV world. I attempted to make this representative of the non-McV world, and it became so big that it, you know, to fit it on one page was not legible. So this is kind of, you know, just a demonstration of a, a a portion of what we're looking at. Next slide, please. So in Oregon, we have federal dollars like the Maternal Infant Early Childhood Home Visiting, or MCB. We have Medicaid, we have Title V and Social Services Block Grant, as well as general funds that are contributing to our home visiting uh, service network. Uh, also local funding, philanthropy and fundraising. While I wasn't able to get a full accounting, I did learn that the early learning division is uh, spending 179.9 million in uh, general funds for OPK, healthy families and relief nurseries annually. Uh, the McVeigh grant is around 8.5 million. SSBG or social services block grant has been around $10 million um, and family connects is estimated to be another $29 million. So, there are a lot of investments. There are other investments that were a little tricky to track down for this meeting today in terms of how much Medicaid is, is going toward home visiting currently, as well as uh, all the early Head Start programs that are um, identified by the federal government are receiving federal funds. So that would be sort of another infusion because they're a direct federal to local um, grant. So thinking back to the previous slide, we don't need to go back, but thinking back to that previous slide, all those lines, um, so all those funding sources also come with monitoring and reporting requirements. So that's just something to hold in mind is that anytime there's a funding stream, there comes with it a, a need to do monitoring and reporting. And I, I feel having been at this for about a decade now that people work really hard to coordinate these. It's certainly, I mean, that was the impetus of, of my convening the table of the collaborative was how do we at the state coordinate ourselves so that those, those like yellow ovals at the bottom are getting one message from the state. That's really important to me, regardless of the agency or the, or the program that, that they're getting consistent supportive messages. Next slide, please. Okay, without a doubt, the most difficult uh, thing in home visiting, it seems in terms of data is figuring out what is the unmet need or how many families we are really serving. Um, so for example, uh, so unmet need, meaning families who might benefit from the service but aren't necessarily receiving it because there isn't an available home, a home visitor with available um, room for another enrollment. So an example, the data that the Health Resources and Services Administration provided to us, MIGV, for our 2020 needs assessment indicated that we were reaching about 37% of eligible families. Um, so this was data from 2019. And then when we applied the filter of children living in poverty, that decreased to 18%. We worked with Portland State University, Beth Green, I'm sure many of you are familiar with her, to do the needs assessment. And when they looked even closer, they found that that average, that our state average of families 
who could benefit from home visiting who are not in the service was as low as eight. Part of this is the way we count families is in enrollment. So if um, one family is enrolled at the beginning of the year and the end of the year, they count as one. If I'm a home visitor and I have a family that drops unexpectedly and I enroll a new family, it counts as two. So that's just an example of why we get these largely differing numbers of like, how, what is our capacity and what is the unmet need? Uh, because of this, I do tend to use information from the National Home Visiting Resource Center. And I, I see now that um, Christy provided some documents from them. It's a great resource. Um, and so they are, their last estimate is that we're reaching as little as 2%. One of the reasons that I, um, that I use their data is that they will report, they work with the national model offices and they will re report all so for example, Healthy Families America. I fund some services for Healthy Families America. Um, those get counted in the state numbers. So they count for McVie, they get counted in the state numbers. And then what's reported to the National Home Visiting Resource Center is the, the full state numbers. So I tend to use that because it's the least duplicated count that I can find. The limitation is that it's only counting uh, the, those models that meet the evidence of effectiveness through the home visiting evidence of effectiveness or evidence-based models. So it's a, it's a plus on one hand and that it's the least duplicated, but it's a minus in that it doesn't, it's not inclusive. So, sorry, in the last reporting year, um, the, yeah, okay. In the last reporting year that's available from the National Home Visiting Resource Center, the evidence-based home visiting programs served 420, sorry, 4,256 families. There were 4,992 children. 85% of the children enrolled in home visiting, and this is pretty typical. We're under the age of three. Many of our programs do go to five, but it's most common that, that families exit around the, eight, the child's age of three. And 23 to 24%, it was 23 in um, 2020, and then 24 in 2021 were Spanish speaking um, families. Uh, their first language was Spanish. And I just, before leaving this one, again, when I talk about families who could benefit, what the National Home Visiting Resource Center is using are things like um, children living in poverty, uh, previous child welfare experiences substance use issues, et cetera. So it's those family stressors um, that are also the, the items that make families eligible for the service as well. Next slide, please. Um, so we have a little bit of information, not maybe as much as we want on our home visiting workforce. <laughs> so we're, we're wanting to learn more. Um, we, Oregon McBee is currently enrolled in what the Health Resources and Services Administration is calling a coordinated state evaluation on workforce well-being. And for that process, we're again working with Beth Green in Portland State. They came up with an estimate of 450 to 500 home visitors um, working across the state in Oregon today. The donuts, I guess, on the bottom are from uh, in 2019, Oregon was part of a regional workforce assessment uh, as uh, part of a Region 10 innovation grant. And in that process, we learned that home visitors across the region, so that's uh, Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington, uh, of the home visitors that were assessed or interviewed at that time, 58% were bachelor's trained of home visitors, 47% of the supervisors, um, in terms of graduate degrees, 15% of the home visitors had a graduate degree and 40% of the supervisors had uh, a, a graduate degree. What I also, before leaving the slide, sorry, should have said this at the beginning, when we have attempted these uh, workforce assessments and evaluations, uh, whether regionally or just in the state, these are not limited to just programs funded by McVie. We have always worked to reach out to other programs who are not funded by McVie so that we really are able to tell the story of what the workforce looks like uh, when it's something broad like this, because we don't want to just know about the programs that McVie funds. Next slide, please. 
from that same study in 2019, uh, these findings came up. So the average age is 41 to 46, um, 38 to, ah, sorry, Nari, I misread. Home visitor, average age is 46. Supervisor, average age is 46. For home visitors, 38% are people of color. Supervisors, only 22% are people of color. 62% um, had prior experience in early childhood. Um, so they may have come from a, an early care and education environment. 33% were in the home visiting field for less than two years. Our average in Oregon were, was 15 families per caseload and home visitors averaged $20.78 per hour, while supervisors were at 27, 20, 27. So that's just a snapshot from 2019. Um, our current uh, coordinated state evaluation on workforce well-being is more narrowly focused on um, uh, race impacts in home visiting. Next slide, please. So again, um, when we did our needs assessment, like, like the workforce evaluations, we've tried to be more extensive than just counties that are eligible for McBee funding, et cetera. So to really look at what the, the landscape of home visiting looks like. So in that 2020 needs assessment, we did find some broad opportunities for um, additional work. And those include service coordination in particular, for services that a parent might access, such as substance use disorder treatment or um, services for depression, it's intimate partner violence, et cetera, that, that those really could be strengthened in terms of service coordination. Hard to reach families, whether they be families that live remotely um, or families that don't see themselves represented in home visiting, so they may be of other cultures. And then um, opportunities to enhance the workforce in particular, um, well, and to stabilize it, but also to enhance the workforce's ability to be present with a family who might be experiencing some challenges with substance use, misuse, um, or intimate partner violence, et cetera. So increasing their comfort in working with those, what I tend to call adult problems that many home visitors sort of panic. I shouldn't say that. I, I, many home visitors enter the field thinking early childhood. And so when presented with adult-like problems, it can be a little intimidating. So how, how might we increase their comfort level with working with those, those families experiencing those family stressors? And I think that concludes my slides. I think we actually have a reflection slide again. <laughs> Thank you, Benjamin. It, it still just surprises me that the, the pay rate, I guess it shouldn't surprise me because pretty much everything in early childhood is, is compensated so poorly, but uh, it's hard to build a workforce when people are making that kind of hourly rate. Mary, I see your hand up. And this is probably for future conversations, um, but I uh, just want to note it here in terms of the eligibility. One of the things you mentioned is prior involvement with child welfare. And as we look at trying to reduce child welfare's involvement in families, what impacts is that going to have as we're thinking about a system? So I'm excited that this group is together so we can think together about how those things intersect and how we can support it moving forward. But as you said, that just made me think about that. Hi, thank you. Um, I wondered some of the things that Benjamin, you reported, uh, like the amount of investment from the ELD, I was writing as quickly as I could. I wonder if in the future, this group could look at sort of a, a simple report of that, just to get a sense of like the Oregon's investment across departments. Um, the other thing that uh, you talked about that I would love uh, more information is that uh, report on the number of families like potentially eligible versus served. And then it sounds like um, it's hard to 
capture, but maybe that would help this group to sort of be able to wrap their arms around, what are we talking about in terms of like reach? And uh, I think that one of the things that it brings up for me is what we've heard in the community or what we learned in our project, which is that it the data is really the grounding thing for um, helping build relationships when we all can look at and see there's so many more families that could be served than are being served that any competition around serving families goes away because there's so many families that could be served. So I think that would be really helpful and grounding. And then my last question comment is that um, you mentioned, Benjamin, the sort of criteria for home visiting and um, eligibility and like risk factors and things like that. And it made me think of Family Connects. And I wondered, Kate, if like, does that not include Family Connects as a universal? And how does that fit in with this equation, I guess? I'll start with your first question, <laughs> which is it became very clear to me that this is an assignment that uh, we need to do, which is really account for all as as much as we possibly can all the funding streams so that we really can say what is Oregon's what is the investment in home visiting in Oregon today more clearly so thank you um because I was you know got part way through and I was like oh I forgot this one oh I forgot you know so um it was just sort of like yep this is this is a, a an urgent uh task for us um and um yeah I would love to figure out uh, uh the sort of unmet need equation and service capacity in a better way. Um, and I keep trying to, I, I see this as an opportunity of how, how might we get there to, as a, as a broader group, agree on what, what counts as unmet need and what, you know, how do we count capacity? Um, because we, we have struggled with that um, in terms of, yeah we tend to report how many families were enrolled and and call that our service capacity when it's not necessarily accurate like i said if you have families entering and not finishing you might have you might count two families instead of one who stayed in the program um, etc and you are correct in that i'll start this and let kate finish that family connects is not an eligibility based i mean you're eligible if you're born so um <laughs> So it, it is, it's different in that sense. And I think that it has the potential to increase families' knowledge of the home visiting world um, in a way that is less stigmatizing and is seen as in as a sustained family support um, that could put even further strain. Um, I have concerns about the Family First Prevention Services Act, um, having some really, I, I, I'm appreciative of the broad eligibility, but I, I also think that there's op opportunities for a, a Family Connects visit to identify eligibility for home visiting. So how do we keep that from looking like a pipeline to child welfare? Yeah, and I'll just jump in a little bit here. I um, I do think it's going to be a little bit of a game changer once we get the Family Connects, the universally offered home visiting rolled out statewide. Uh, we're going to have information about um, a lot more of that referral, you know, and, and again, getting back to what was said at the very beginning, this home visiting is voluntary and free. Um, and so by having that touch point with families, with all families to see if they want any home visiting, you know, that, that brief intervention um, that is non-eligibility based, then that's an opportunity to share what other programs are out there. And it will generate, I, I think Benjamin's right, a lot more interest and desire. And it's about family wanting to join um, the, the longer term home visiting programs. Um, so with that, I think we're going to get a better handle on what the need is and what the desire is for families to participate in those programs. And I think there's a little bit of a, there's a nuanced difference. I mean, there may be a need and if the family doesn't want to, that's their choice. And so um, 
but I think as we go through this work and as that gets rolled out, it's not gonna be rolled out for a while statewide, but um, when that happens, I think we're gonna be able to much more clearly define what um, the workforce challenges are. And, um, and it's not just, it's, it's also like how evenly distributed is, um, are these programs across the state um, so that it's not that if you live in one county you get a lot more opportunities and if another county you don't get any um, we want to work towards creating a more equitable system so that no matter where you live should you choose and want the services they're available to you but that's part of this the work that we're going to be moving towards i hope that helps Brenda. I just wanted to follow up a little bit on um, Kate's early comments here about Family Connects and thinking about our consistent messaging about that as an intervention versus a long term. I think that's one of the challenges to how we talk about us as a system and how we um, build partnerships is if it's um, for some, if it's still seen as a replacement or a competition versus part of a continuum, that's a that's a big challenge for us. The other thing that comes to mind in thinking about the challenge about measuring reach is that I know the conversations we're having um, is really a, around what the right set of services are for families, not what program. And so we know that some uh, families need um, potentially a nurse home visiting component, but also a, a social support system that would come, for instance, from a healthy families um, or an early Head Start system, and those might need to happen simultaneously. And so if we're looking at it through the lens of meeting the family's needs versus how we navigate to programs, that's a whole different challenge about how we measure capacity and um, what need looks like, so. Thank you, Brenda. Melissa. Well, a couple of things. I think uh, like adequacy of, you know, services compared to the need need is always a challenge. You don't know the need unless someone speaks up. So we're trying to push the message of the services on to individuals. And until we see the utilization compared to the push, we're not gonna get to a true, are we serving the needs? Um, there are several ways to go about that. And I think, you know, from a, a health plan perspective, you know, we're always looking at network adequacy. And you know, requirements are are pretty squishy. We don't have any solid like you need to have um, you know this type of ratio member versus provider. And it really comes down to you know our our individuals complaining what has the utilization been, um, and you know access is like and when they're picking up the phone to call or when they're requesting the service, are they able to get it? Um, so there, you know, are some, you could look to a health plan perspective um, when looking at that. Uh, I want to share this really quick analysis I did on some overlapping programs. Can I, can I share something? Uh, that would be a question for Kelly. I think you were the host and would be able to so I'll talk through, I looked at a number of different programs that uh, touch our members um, and individuals and communities, looking at what happens in public health, like Babies First, Nurse Family Partnership, Family Connects, Cocoon, Parents as Teachers, and then we have the Community Doula Program. And all of those have like prenatal and postnatal care to some degree, all of them include the parent and the child. All of them include screenings, which is a big problem. All of them re include referrals. You can't have enough space for um, referrals, but screen that's a lot of questions to be asking people yeah. all the time. 
it's invasive for someone to be in your home. So how do we balance, how do we look across all those programs? And that's why I was pushing for like an assessment of, of what those other um, programs are and the intersections that happen and how do we m really make this seamless for an individual. It's all about that SDOH, like screening and, and sharing and referrals and being able to monitor that so that community information exchange. Um, but how do we get to that when all these programs are funded by numerous different entities I can tell you right now I'm funding things that are already funded by other other entities. Right. Um, and so how do we get control over that if we don't really know? And then it, it is the screenings that are concerning family connects. I know there's like 60 some odd questions for the mother, the parent and the child. Wow. is a whole separate set of questions and so it's like are some of those questions handled by other organizations if they were in those programs first like do we have a centralized screening thing and we can share that anyways that's a lot of stuff <laughs> um, but that's why i'm here <laughs> <laughs> Listen, that, that kind of that kind of segues to the the next real major part of the agenda, and uh, I think Kelly let you uh, share if you have something you want to share. Do you have, I don't know if you have a visual or oh, I do share. have a, a visual. Um, I I'll show you real quick. It's not it's not that critical. I talked through it, but I was just trying to think of um, you know what are what are all of these touch points for the member, um, the families and that are in these programs and where are these programs governed? And I think there was, um, there was another point that I was gonna add in here as we were talking, but now I lost it because I went off on a tangent. Um, <laughs> but, you know, trying to identify all of the intersections with all of these programs and, and you know, Benjamin, you shared that the messy map, right? Well, for a CCO, we have like dozens of those messy maps in different spaces. Like when you think about housing and you think about um, the different community programs we're involved with in this funding streams. And so I'm very familiar with those messy maps. Um, so anyways, just kind of giving you a little bit of where my brain space is. Appreciate it. Yeah, if you could send it to Christy, I'm sure Christy could send it out to the, to the rest of the the committee if you're up for that just so we have we all have something to work with there yeah sure just so there's no confusion this is our intensive care coordination um program so we're doing all the same things too <laughs> yeah gotcha good, good point though it's a all really right. good point so we, we we have about a half hour left Thank folks you. and uh i, I think uh, um the next thing we have on agenda is just to take one minute just to stretch out a little bit because we all been sitting in our chairs for an hour and a half so and uh, there's a, a couple of uh, cartoons to contemplate here. Just, just take one minute to stretch and we'll get right back to it. Beware of Good modeling, Peter. I see you stretching there. Yep, absolutely. Doing some, stair absolutely. some chair stretches. All right. Feel free to send me any comics. I've been collecting them from our newspaper and the Count Dracula one. I laughed out loud. <laughs> I was like, I couldn't imagine his ah, ah, ah. Worst weight loss coach. Very good. Well, in the last half hour, we just want to cover um, a little bit just to, to continue this conversation of what the heck's a system. And uh, I think Liz was, was giving us a really good overview of like, what the heck do we have to work with here? What is the system? And Christy and Benjamin, I'm going to toss to you to just to, to, to yeah. see how you want to go through and present some information. Yeah, here. yeah. we're going to we're going to go through this section pretty quickly um, because it is really about priming the pump. Um, I don't know if that those images aren't showing up. They're it's okay. I feel like they're showing up there. I think I'm this is just priming the pump. Mm -hmm. It's okay. I think we're going to look at it in this version just so we can see it's, um, and you can even see that this kind of raising awareness about the different frameworks 
and the ways that either other states or even within our state talk about coordinating home visiting service networks. So this is about the committee getting some of an, an eyeball and an ear on some of the language that other peoples or partners um, or regions are using to talk about home visiting systems. So it's not an, an in-depth dive to any of it. I'm calling it a sampler. And so let's so this these images to me map on directly to what Benjamin shared in terms of that crazy systems map. So we're trying to create an image of a system really specifically for this very, very cross-sector um, field, which is home visiting, which crosses many sectors in our state. And so it's going to be complicated. But one of the places that we can look to for information and ideas is North Carolina. They have a home visiting and parenting education system components very well laid out. Uh, it's something that the working team will be looking at. And um, the, the working team is going to be looking at a lot of different stuff, but this is just one kind of set of information for us to think about these components around governance, financing, you know, assessment, monitoring and accountability, um, evaluation and continuous quality improvement, and then workforce or professional development and training. Those are how they've bundled their systems work. And they bundled it with parenting education, which to those who are new to the Home visiting arena, the state of Oregon has a pretty robust parenting education system called Oregon Parenting Education Collaborative. So that's something for us to note and to keep track of. And also um, Harriet's on the call here too, but the these same components are part of uh, some resources that the BUILD Initiative, the National BUILD Initiative has helped pull together too. So we'll be looking to that as a resource for the working team and probably likely the committee as well. Next slide. So that's North Carolina, as they call their system components. We looked at Colorado as well. They call their components sort of investment plans or strategy areas. You'll see a lot of overlap. Theirs is around like what's available. We were talking about the service gap earlier. What kind of collaboration is happening between programs? How about coalition and advocacy? Again, you see funding. Here's uh, that piece. I think, Melissa, you were talking about the outreach, marketing, and awareness workforce and then they have a separate component around what did they learn the last couple of years because a lot changed in the home visiting world during COVID-19 years. Next slide. There are several other states that we can look to. Those are two that are important. And then I, Benjamin, do you want to do the slide or would you like me to just run through it? If you got it, go for it. Might I'm be going. I'm on a speed <laughs> train here. Um, I hopefully this is you're getting the sense it's just a sampler to kind of prime the pump for language, but the um, federal McV uh, funding stream also elevates really and causes alignment and integration as a key ingredient for any programming work and what that's around facilitating good communication and coordination across programs, coordinating the entry of services, making sure that it's integrated brought with the broader early childhood home visiting system, and then of course, focusing on coordinated professional development or workforce. So even in those three samplers, and then we're gonna see one more from Ford Family Foundation, you can see a lot of overlap. So we're not going from a blank slate here. We have lots of things to help drive our thinking around what these components are, and then the recommendations that might happen or fall underneath these different components. Next slide. So I'm going to turn it over to Robin Hill Dunfer for just a couple minutes to talk about the Ford Family Foundation's Rural Home Visiting System Coordination Project and that the way that they talk about their system components in that project. Thank you, Christy. And the I think it's on page 38 of the materials is the theory of action that's on this slide. Um, so as Christy even mentioned at the very beginning, Ford Family Foundation began investing in home visiting system coordination for more than six years now in three specific regions, Douglas Klamath Lake, Coos Curry, and Siskiyou County, California. So the theory of action in your materials, um, many of you know Beth Green and her stellar team. She's a research professor, a director of the Early Childhood and Family Support Research Center for Improvement of Child and Family Services at Portland State University. They really have walked alongside us and the communities in the development and evaluation of the work that we have been doing. This um, slide gives you a snapshot of our aim, our strategy, and really increasing coordination among home visiting programs in the communities so that um, more families are served and that um, I will not go all over all of this right now. Obviously, it's in your attachments but I'll be happy to share more in the future or answer questions. And then in the next slide, 
think the next slide. Thank you. Thank you. So just really quickly, um, but I'm going to slow it down so that you can understand me, is the uh, four main strategies that, which you might see some similarities with that make these slide, but the four main strategies that we focus on in this project that have remained the same um, even after more than six years. Um, there are a lot of things that we've revised, but this is something we have not. Internal communication is the first strategy. This is a really critical place to start, just like this meeting started where building local relationships, but building relationships is at the center of a lot of human stuff, right? So we can't do anything without building relationships. So the leadership at the table in community as sort of the foundation for coordination is how this was approached. Uh, we measured collaboration and relationships. And so I, one example that I wanted to share was in 2016, we asked program leaders in the communities through interviews and surveys about their how they felt about effective working together to improve their own home visiting system and only 50% agreed that they had effective means of working together in 2016 and by 2000 or 2021 92% um, said that they had effective working relationships um, to try and work together on home visiting systems so that's a, just a great example of um, dedicated time and energy on something that what you can do over time and that it takes time. The second is coordinated intake and referral. This one's obviously very critical and really at the crux sort of of all of our hopes around this through this ultimate goal that more families are served, less families fall through cracks. And of course, there's no wrong door, but that's sim simplifying the complexity of home visiting options to referring partners, other agencies, and messaging um, is really a part of that coordinated intake and referral. Uh, the third strategy, shared professional development. This is really important strategy for so many reasons, um, but really sharing resources and opportunities, especially in rural communities where there are less opportunities in general, that it was important to start here and learn across models. Also that they have shared um, language, they get to put a face with a name if they provide or if they participate in trainings together. The understanding sort of helps them value you, each other as well. So like I might say, after spending three days in a training with someone locally, like I know Emily and I know the kind of services she provides. So if I, you know, have space and I, a family doesn't fit, but it might fit her model, I feel really comfortable. So it's relationship again, right? Um, and then finally, the fourth strategy is external communication. And this really, um, our strategy around enhancing this is important for families, referring agencies, um, what it, home visiting is, what it isn't. I think something was um, mentioned earlier about Family Connects and the ability to sort of normalize home visiting and that, that language, that really resonates with me as there's a lot of confusion and sometimes um, ex, um, beliefs about what home visiting is or is not. So it's really important and needed. And also I really learned from the communities that there's such still, there's such a need for a unified and sort of coordinated communication. Um, and that even in our regions, uh, folks want help with that. They don't wanna come up with their own. They really want sort of a larger global approach to Oregon's messaging around it. Um, that is model neutral. And so I am going to stop because I think I probably am already over my two minutes, but thank you for an opportunity to share. I'll be happy to share more in the future if there's an opportunity. Thank you so much, Robin. I think what um, what we'll do is um, we can absolutely share more information about the Ford Family Foundation's project. There's a lot of written documentation about it. Uh, that the working team is definitely going to use and dive into, and we're happy to share any with this group as well, uh, make it available. I think for the sample of home visiting section, I hope you just take away that there's a lot of overlaps, right? If you took a look at just these four examples in the sampler, we can kind of see a general kind of trend for the kind of things uh, and the kind of ways to talk about that home visiting systems components. And so the working team will be bringing that forward to the um, committee to think about and talk about as a way to kind of help structure and create the framework for the home visiting systems work. 
So thank you very much, Robin. I appreciate you sharing that. And I know there will be more opportunity to learn more from Ford Family's work. So th there's this slide. Uh, I think our co-chairs, there was maybe some raised blood pressure that could have happened when we shared the slide a couple of weeks ago with them because uh, it's a pretty uh, quick time frame. And so the the things that I want to point out here, um, so the subcommittee, aka the working team, is going to be meeting every month until December, but also doing work between meetings. And the working team members are very aware of this, so we'll be using a lot of strategies and tools to get work done and move decision-making forward between meetings as well as at meetings. Uh, they aren't public meetings as this one is, but we'll be sharing information with you all and of course with the collaborative and our community partners. So one thing I wanted to, Melissa, talk about here particularly and try to help address your question, which is also our uh, a main question and concern for us, which is how do we amplify community and family voice? One of the first ways that we are planning to do it as a the co-chairs um, met just yesterday is that we're prioritizing family voice in all of the first pass of data. So we're phasing our data analysis because there's so much, but we are getting together everything that we can put our hands on that had that is based on parent voice right now. So there's a lot of focus groups that happen. There's lots of data gathered from families and parents. And so we felt the best way to honor that existing information and those um, previous the commitment of time and energy that parents had already done by collecting that information. And we actually made our packets and getting ready to send them out to the working team. We're happy to share all of those with you as, as well. And I'll share one example of one uh, during in the homework reading that's you, that were being used. We'll also have kind of, I'm gonna call it kind of two rounds of opportunity for parent and community feedback. So we have lots of different act, uh, partners and access um, to, I'm going to use actually the word critique. So as we kind of start synthesizing data and lifting up some ideas or some initial ideas around recommendations for home visiting systems, we'll be sending those out for uh, critical feedback from existing parenting groups. So there are parent leadership groups that exist in different programs. There are home visiting groups that we have access to as well. And so we're getting ready to reach out to those community partners and give them a heads up now that we would be hoping to connect and connect some critical feedback early in October and early in November. And I have um, every reason to believe that would continue to happen and be a structured part uh, as part of the recommendations move forward past even this year into the next year. But you can see it's a pretty quick timeline uh, to get recommendations to you on your December 8th meeting so that you can move those forward or uh, suggest changes to them uh, in order to put them forward to the ELC meeting that's also in December. So I'm going to pause there for just a minute. Melissa, I don't know if that helps to address some of your concern or if you have other things that you would um, add or would like to know more about. I think the intent is, is um, to get oh, to January to be able to put forth some legislation if necessary. Um, is that, is that part of it? I, I think I, I would leave to Peter and um, Peg to talk about that. I think we're a little bit out, sync, out of sync with trying to get any strong legislative pieces for 2023, um, but I can let others speak to that. And actually, I, I apologize, Mary, I was wanting to make sure that your question about family voice and community voice was also addressed during this slide. I want to check in with you. Yes, thank you. I um, it, I appreciate both honoring the voices that have already been given um, and not just tapping resources, uh, parents over and over again, um, but also then the like ongoing community feedback with those um, existing groups of parents. That sounds good. Thank you. All right, thank you. I don't know if Sue or Peter or Peg, if you want to chime in on Melissa's question about trying to hit get getting anything to the 2023 legislative session it is late to be uh looking at january as a way to introduce it there there are oftentimes vehicles moving in legislature though that we might be able to attach an idea or two to uh in order to to move forward but uh, uh we also have resources through the early learning council which of course includes ode and oha and uh, odhs 
and community housing, uh, just, just through those agencies, we might be able to start implementing ideas starting in January if there is uh, some consensus. And uh, I would just add, Peter, obviously he's been there, so he knows how the legislature works. Um, but we'll also be trying to work very closely with whomever the new governor is and try to incorporate some of the recommendations and thinking in her budget and, and priorities. Yeah, thanks. I was just kind of wondering why, why the timeline is on a, a certain trajectory. The, the new governor will have till uh, the 1st of February to prepare her budget too. So it is, it's good to be able to have conversations um, if, there need, if there is any kind of budgetary ask. Makes sense. So, so Peg, I think the next thing we have on the agenda is go to where the ball will be. And um, <laughs> I'm gonna toss that to you. <laughs> All right, well, I think that the whole idea of this, um, this topic is to at least plant the seed that um, we want to be prepared. All of this work um, and plans are going to come with the need for resources um, and money. And we want to be at least... Uh, in tune with what those needs are and maybe kind of tee that up. So um, in, in making the plans, we have to look at possible um, resources that are available to carry those through. So we don't just have this great working plan at the end of this, and then it takes another uh, year or two to put anything into fruition. So I think as we're developing this plan, we want to be able to have some forward thinking on that as well, as far as the resources that are going to be needed to carry it through. We don't have to finalize those, certainly, but at least be thinking about that. Anybody have comments about that? My only comment, it, it's a great goal for us to be able to hopefully end this process with an understanding of, uh, of really what sort of system we would love to see in terms of home visiting, uh, where the funding and clarity on the, all the funding sources, and then uh, that question of like, what could our capacity be and what does it need to be and how do we get there? And I think Gritsy just likes using Lots of photos on her slides. So she, she <laughs> had a good time doing this. I do, I do like a good visual. Um, I would just also add that get, this connects to the previous slide as well, just around the recommendations piece and what's going to happen. But I absolutely imagine that there'll be, you know, sh very short term, midterm, and long term recommendations that come out of the working team, things that are much more immediate and low hanging fruit, if you will things that might be able to be action, you know, actionable more quickly and things that might take longer. I could imagine the recommendations having you know, some of both of those things. Uh, and so that idea of going to where the ball will be, there may be a there already there and it's just a matter of kind of organizing people or existing resources, or they may not exist. The people and resources may not exist yet that could help recommendations come to fruition. So I think trying to think about that broadly around like that what we already have that we can work with and then what might be missing that we're going to need to get in place to move the systems work forward. Well, with that, we're, we're kind of caught up to, on the agenda. Uh, we have a little bit of time to just uh, write down questions. Uh, just take a couple of minutes and uh, either share verbally or in the chat. Um, what comments or questions are coming up for folks? Melissa, go ahead. Sorry, me again. Um, I am wondering where our, the working team is meeting monthly, but we are not. I, 
forget that piece. Correct. The, the okay. working team meets monthly, but this committee meets every other month. Okay. Yeah, I would just, yeah, as as we think about creative ways to, uh, you know, move the workflow forward, but engaging us along the way, because then that's few and far between, but I'm not advocating for more meetings. Um, but in thinking about uh, the assessment and what we're assessing, like, do we have on the work team side, do we have an opportunity for input there? And and I had some more thoughts in relation to that too. One of the things I struggle with is what is the level of qualifications that uh, folks need for um, you know these programs and and home visits and and for a lot of them we do have RNs and there is a severe workforce shortage and um, but you know thinking about is it. Is it something we consider? Do are we able to use uh, traditional health workers for these types of things? I also there are some really cool things happening um, between uh, law enforcement and behavioral health, and I go back to what Benjamin said about the risk of someone entering someone's home, and and there may be a situation that is unsafe, um, and how do you handle those things? So how do you how do you look for cues for signs of trouble um, or danger? And uh, I know there's a police department in, in my region that has a behavioral health individual that comes with them on calls and they've equipped her with the Kevlar va a vest. And um, so I, I, we don't have to go to that extreme, but I'm just saying there's some correlations between, you know, how does law enforcement um, get trained to to handle those situations. So is there some kind of synergy or or training um, to think about in that respect? But um, in any event, just throwing throwing all that out, you you asked what was on my mind at this moment. So <laughs> thank you, Melissa. Anyone else? Thoughts from anyone else? I think one of the things that takes some time to build is the workforce. And I agree. I think we need to look at what the qualifications are um, as far as the, the folks that can do home visiting. Um, because in many cases, it doesn't require uh, advanced medical knowledge. Um, again, I think a lot of this is about relationship building and um, knowing what services are available in the community that they can attach the family to or help the family get attached to. And um, uh, it, that's gonna take some time to build that workforce. So I think, again, if we're looking at trying to be forward thinking, we really have to look at that. Um, it's Neil. I thought today was a good baseline context to to where the where we're building from, and I am excited to see how the work groups um, focus can help to provide themes and uh, other items for us to kind of dig into. So I, I think we can come up with a, a you know a giant list and get really excited about um, how we do that work, and um, as they're so close to the. To the implementation side, it'll be really um, great to have that data and information and those decision points or steering committee points to engage with as we move the project forward. So Kate put, Kate put in the, uh, the chat, I can imagine a table that describes each model, eligibility, workforce requirements, funding, et cetera. I think we have one somewhere. Does anyone know, know of a, a chart such as the one Kate is suggesting? I, I wasn't sure if Benjamin, if we've done that. I feel like we did that a while ago and we need to maybe unearth it or recreate it just so that it is pretty contemporary. But that's something that I think would be really, really helpful just to get an understanding of what the different models are and what are the requirements. Some of them are evidence-based models that have very specific requirements. Others are a little bit more flexible um, and I, and we need all of it to create a, a system that be, is able to provide um, 
the right service to the right family at the right time. So um, I think this is really helpful in terms of being able to see the breadth and depth of what, what is available in Oregon. Thank you, Kate. I also think just the, the idea of a common assessment, I'm sure people have been discussing this, uh, but boy, that would be a, a huge step forward if there was a common assessment of some kind. Very good. Well, um, we have just a, does anyone else have any thoughts before we, we wrap it up? We're standing between you and lunch. So we're going to, we'll just go ahead and, and wrap it up. Uh, Christy, I think we had some, uh, do we have homework for people? What's, what's on the, the last slide? Yes, we do. On the next slide, there is, um, so this is why your packet is so enormous. <laughs> Were you like, did you, did anybody's heart stop when they saw that it was like 180 pages? Anyway, so these are things um, that we are going to be, these are things that I think would be helpful, again, for us to kind of get on the same page. These are not super in-depth. Most of them are high-level overview pieces, except for the 2020 needs assessment. So the working team will be using the Oregon Equity Lens questions that are on its page three. So that's included in your packet. You can take a look at that. But that those questions uh, will be grounding and centering our work the entire time. The second piece from the National Home Visiting Resource Center, those are just prime. So there's an at a glance, which is four pages, and there's a primer about home visiting. Just a caveat that those are only evidence-based programs. So again, like we, we are trying for a bigger tent than that but this still helps you get a sense about home visiting from a really reliable source in a sh in few pages. I think the Children's Institute 2019 home visiting policy brief is more Oregon specific. And so it gives some really Oregon specific information and is well written, also short, attends to some of the systems questions and things that we are will be attending to. Because again, a reminder, like we're working on systems, not program recommendations. So we're steering completely clear of that level and working at this next level up above that, right? To help coordinate and uh, and help with systems alignment. And then lastly, the McVie 2020 needs assessment. It's a large document. So I just called out three specific areas that you might wanna start in, but you may have interest in reading all of it. Of course, the executive summary, but the appendix D, uh, Mary is a great example of one of the things that we're going to be focusing on first in the working team. So it's a parent focus group findings. So we're going to be reading and studying those. And then Appendix E is really helpful too, because there's all kinds of data in Oregon and the PSU researchers actually went through and did some analysis and uh, boiled down a lot of those prior needs assessments into a couple pages. So I would just share those as homework. Um, each of them has you know, has caveats that come with them. They're not the end all be all for all the different kinds of data and info, but I do think they're all great starting places for this group. Thanks, Christy. Peg, do you have any yeah. last words before we? No, I, I appreciate everybody's time and, and uh, am impressed with uh, the energy and, and the knowledge that's already existing there. So I'm, I've learned a lot today. Absolutely. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Christy, for all your work getting this organized. Thank you all for participating. And uh, best of luck to the working group. Go, go, go. And uh, we'll see you all again in October. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank thanks you, a lot. Thank you.